You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. Mission Log Prodigy, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. Supplemental. Prodigy Novels, Supernova. Welcome into another episode of Mission Log Prodigy, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast. I'm Norman Lau. And I am Charlyn Schmidt. And just like on our flagship podcast, we here at Mission Log Prodigy love to take a look at an episode, review it, dissect it for morals, messages, and meanings. And we would do that only we're between seasons one and two right now. So instead, we've got something else for you today. And that is another product review. That's right. And please remember, this show is produced for both YouTube and as a regular podcast. So please be sure to engage the like button and subscribe to Mission Log Prodigy on the Roddenberry Entertainment YouTube channel. That helps you get the feed from the algorithm on YouTube. So the more likes, the more subscriptions, the more you'll see this in your feed. And please make sure to listen to all of our podcasts on podcasts.roddenberry.com and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and Spotify and Stitcher, wherever you listen to your Roddenberry podcast. And you can also follow <laughs> us always on Mission Log Prodigy on Twitter. That's at ML underscore Prodigy to keep up with all the latest news and updates, just like this show. Because like Char said, we're in the middle of uh, season one and season two, and we're in that kind of waiting period. But in that waiting period, that we, we have are. products to review. And this is what you've been waiting for. So this is what we're doing today. We are going to do a review for the very first official Star Trek Prodigy young adult novel, Supernova, which Char just flashed on the screen. So remember, for those of you who are listening to the audio version of the show, you didn't get a chance to see the wonderful glossy cover for Star Trek Supernova. And if you're watching it, that's a little bit of a bonus for you. We're going to start with a review <laughs> of the product packaging, uh, the liner yeah. nose and the gorgeous, like um, the gorgeous cover. If you get the hardcover version of the book and uh, we're going to go into some other details, but we're not going to go into a, a deep, deep, deep review because what we don't want to do is do the book report. So you don't have to buy it. That's not what we want to do. <laughs> we, we are want... not doing a book report. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yes, we, yeah. uh, this is not school. And we, yeah, we want to encourage everybody to read the book. So we don't want to tell you all that happens. We want to kind of give you some clues that'll entice you to read it. That's about mm -hmm. it. Right. And we hope you do. We hope you support the products that are coming out because in the Prodigy community, there's a lot of uh, like a, a soft criticism of there aren't enough products. When are we going to get some stuff that we can buy and collect? Well, this is one of those kind of products. So let's yes. just jump right into it with what is this story, Shar? What is this story? Well, yeah. it's kind of interesting because it is both a book and a video game, which okay. I will say up front, we have, I've not played yet. Have you played it? I haven't played it either. So it'll be really interesting to hear from people that have both played the game and read the book. And if one really compliments the other, or if one's more robust than the other, I would have to believe that a video game is probably going to be a little bit more expansive because, you know, you have live worlds, you have um, Brett, Brett Gray and Ella Purnell, you know, you have all of the voice actors from right. Star Trek Prodigy voicing the actual characters, their characters in game. So that's, that's a luxury that video games can bring to life instead of a book. Sure. But I would love to hear from folks who've done both as well, just because I, I have not played the video game, but I have read the book mm -hmm. and I I really enjoyed it overall. Like I, I might be a grown adult, but a young adult novel is still enjoyable. And I well, age wise, what would you say this is? Nine well, to gonna, twelve. Well, we're going to get into all that though, right after your synopsis. So you have the synopsis, oh. and then yeah, we're going to do that, and then we're going to okay, go. Okay, I'm the getting text ahead text. of us. <laughs> well, I know you're excited. I'm excited too because again, we we don't get a chance to review a lot of products. Um, so. No, but yeah. this is why we are, so that they do make more because people will buy them. We want them. We want the merch. That's right. Well, All let's right. get into that synopsis then. This is written by Rob Perlman, and inside the cover it says, The protostar crash lands in a peculiar star system. The crew ends up separated, and Dal and Gwyn must work together to find their missing crewmates. They don't have much time, though. The nearby star is destabilized and in danger of creating a supernova. Hence the title. Mm -hmm. Then Dal and Gwyn 
uh, discover evil droids patrolling the area, and they look just like the Watchers back in Tars Lamora. How will Dal and Gwyn confront this nightmare from their past and prevent an explosion in their near future? It's a big story. Since we both read the book, and this is, again, this is, uh, I don't know how they handled it in the uh, paperback version, because I don't have that. We both have the hardcover version. That's on no. the inside flap, and that's on the, oh, do you have the paperback version? I was going to ask, you have the hardcover? I've got the yeah. paperback. This okay. is the paperback. Is that on the actual inside and inside flap anywhere or is it on the back? Uh, of the book? It is on the back. Okay, so that's the teaser on the back of the book on yeah. the on the hardcover versions on the um it's on the glossy inside, inside flap. And then also on Simon and Schuster's page, uh, there's a little bit of that kind of description too. So without giving too much away, Shar, do you think that that's an accurate synopsis to get somebody to be able to, you know, if they're a fan of Prodigy especially, but if they're not, do you think that that's a representation, a good representation of the story? Is it accurate? Yes. Mm -hmm. Will it entice you? I think it depends on how much of a fan you are. Mm-hmm. And how much of a book lover you are, you know, <laughs> if you're not really into reading a, a, a short novel, you're probably not going to pick this up. You might be playing the video game instead. But if you love books, you are going to enjoy this, okay. uh, at least. And I did. Uh, we'll explain why uh, shortly. Yeah, we have a bunch of, I, I guess, like questions and answers that we're, we're trying to kind of like dance around, like not spoiling the book too much. But so we're going to go into the technical information of the book. So people out there that haven't seen the book, haven't shopped for the book, uh, and are just listening to this podcast for that information. This is the, these are the nuts and bolts of, of what this book is, you know, from a yeah. production standpoint. So this book, this book was released on January 17th of this year, 2023. Okay. So uh, not too long ago, I mean, we were very excited that we were going to get an actual book and it was actually one of two that were released at the same time. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Now the pricing on this book. So Recently, I went on Amazon and I saw the hardcover version for $9.99. I'm going to be, I'm just going to be talking wow. US pricing specifically um, mm -hmm. and some Canadian pricing because that's on the uh, inside jacket too. So actually the book normally goes for $17.99 US, it's $23 Canadian or $23.99 Canadian and the paperback version. How much on the on your book jacket, Char, how much does this book cost? Is it six ninety nine as they advertise on Amazon? Yeah, six ninety nine US, eight ninety nine Canada. Okay, so if you can actually get the hardcover version, if you're a hardcover fan on Amazon, it's a really great deal. Uh, at the time of this recording, uh, this was nine ninety nine on Amazon for the hardcover. So only three bucks yeah. more than the soft cover. But again, hardcover is <laughs> not deal. in everyone's you know everyone's taste. Some people like soft cover the way it reads, the way you can hold it and kind of bend the cover back and flip pages. Everyone has the kind of like reading preference. The preference, yeah. Now, from the Simon and Schuster dot com website, so the book itself is one hundred and sixty pages. Uh, the in intended. Uh, grade uh, for the reading level is three through seven. And the intended age of that reading level is, uh, of course, in concert with those grades, eight through 12. Okay. But, yeah. So, you know, it's it's young adult reading, but not young, mature adult reading or mature young adult reading, I should say. You know, this is more... Yeah. Would, would you say it's um, right in that sweet spot of, say, where Prodigy, the the series is is aimed at for their audience for their target audience yeah, yeah i would say so it this is written for you the mm -hmm. kids now you had when we were reading you 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 screenshotted a page texted me the picture of it and said the about the justification i found that actually really quite annoying and jarring at times like the forced justification of print yes right. just to give a little bit of background we're both font nerds. We have played with fonts in graphic design in our respective careers. And there's this thing called kerning. If you don't know what it is, it's where you can either spread text out so it fits a certain way or you can cinch it in. Some parts of this book are so cinched in, it looks like one giant runoff sentence. Right. That was jarring. Right. Yeah. And I'm not a big fan of like forced justification in paragraphs. I do like seeing uh, my either right or left line work justified so there's a little bit more of organic flow to the edge of the page again that's a matter of preference that's a matter of taste i just felt that if some people don't like that you may want to know that uh yeah in, in that 160 pages though towards the end there is an eight page preview of chapter one from the next book 
A Dangerous Trade by Cassandra Rose Clark. So that's at the end of Supernova. Uh, you can preview that and then you can go into if you want to purchase the next book, which is also available for the same pricing structure. So physically, those two books are the same. You're going to have a little bit different cover art you know, for uh, A Dangerous Trade. And and that, those are the only two books out right now. But I have a little bit more information about future book product releases. And we're going to get to that a little bit later on in the show. But I would love for you, Shar, to let us know who is this author, Rob Perlman? <laughs> well, he's a very familiar name in the Star Trek sphere. He has written so many Star Trek books, but he hasn't done just that. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's written more than 60 books. Stude knows what he's doing. He's done yeah. this a few times. <laughs> but just to throw some titles out of Star Trek books he has done, Fun with Kirk and Spock, Star Trek, my first book of colors. So he does do children's work. Mm -hmm. uh, they've. He's also done one of my favorites, the Book of Grudge. I was thinking of you when I read that in his in his bibliography here. <laughs> Did you have that book? Oh yes, I have. Uh, yeah. I, I wish I had it right by me right now so I could show you, but I no, I don't. Uh, but he's also done several others. Search for Spock, Body by Starfleet which is an exercise book, which I think is fantastic. And huh. Red Shirt's Little Book of Doom, among many others. He does, I, I would characterize his writing as just general pop culture. Mm -hmm. He he get, does things like fandom, Star Trek, and what have you, does conventions. And uh, in his bio, I love this. He says, he lives in New Jersey and summers on Vulcan. Now- Also New Jersey. <laughs> well, I think Vulcan would just be a little less humid, but both would be pretty hot. Yeah. Yeah. I've lived, I've lived through Jersey summers. Those are, are not great. I'm sorry, New Jersey. I love you. I love your pizza, but your summers I can do without. Yeah. And your winters. <laughs> <laughs> There's like literally like a two week period in there where it's absolutely perfect in the garden state. Two weeks. Uh, that yeah. sounds like most places, honestly. <laughs> so you have two books by Rob Perlman. He's new to me. So uh, is the book of grudge, uh, is that a fiction book or is it more of like a facts book about grudge and discovery? Or can you can you tell that this is written by the same person that wrote Supernova? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it's very different in terms mm -hmm. of tone because it's coming from the perspective of a cat. Oh, and it's, okay. It's, All right. You know, what I can show you, it's, it's kind of similar to this calendar I have on my desk. This is supposed to, it's just like kitties and quotes. Uh, there we go. Okay. And it's basically like some sort of like life lesson or profound tidbit of wisdom and a beautiful uh, photo of grudge. I and, see. And you, I you see. flip the pages and you enjoy it. So it's kind of like a grudge POV or a thought POV you know, yeah. type of book, right? Yeah. Yes. And okay. if you like cats, you're really going to enjoy that book. That sounds really interesting. I might have to give that a try. Or maybe you can like, yeah. you know, screenshot me a couple pages and see how <laughs> I like it. You know, a, an eight page teaser, if you will. Um, oh. Yeah. So from, from Rob's website, uh, for those of you who are maybe listening to you in this, you know, in, in your car to this podcast and you haven't looked him up yet and you're interested to know a little bit about Rob Perlman from his website, we also have learned that Rob was also a publishing professional who has acquired and edited a host of pop culture entertainment books, including, and these are like the non-Star Trek books that Char referenced, <laughs> the official Princess Bride cookbook, which I think wow. that sounds like amazing, you know, because I want to see if they actually have like a Miracle Max, you know, like chocolate pill to swallow of sorts, you know, like a candy or uh, let's see, what else do we have it here? Uh, a memoir by Don Bluth, uh, Don Bluth, a famous um, cartoonist, you know, it's a, a humor cartoonist, uh, fandom acts of kindness, leading lady, a memoir by Charles Bush. Hi, honey. Uh Hi, honey, I'm Homo, Parks and Recreation, the official cookbook, drag combing through the big wigs of show business, Bob Ross, the joy of painting, if you're a fan of Bob Ross. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, the cover work on that is fantastic. It looks like a some type of like younger adult type of book. Uh, let's see. Bob's Burgers, Burger Book. Bob's uh, Burgers. <laughs> Zombies on Film, the definitive story of undead cinema, stuck on Star Trek and the Princess Bride to celebrate. I mean, so wow. it's all over there the landscape of pop culture really isn't he's Truly. not one lane or another so no he's like a generalist he's going all over the places doing cookbooks and doing random things it sounds like maybe some biographies even i like and, wow. i like seeing that in an author where they're not just in one lane so you know they kind of lean on their strengths and maybe 
you kind of like feel a pattern like that merge in their work that this is really if you i mean how can you have you have star trek the princess bride uh, parks and recreation and zombie stuff all in like the same conversation with him. Right? Right. Yeah. Wow. That is an incredible body of work. It's no wonder he's a successful writer, though, because if he can shift gears like that, he could do anything. Here's some interesting other tidbits here. So Rob has had successful events and signings at pop culture conventions, comic cons, bookstores, and comic book retailers across the country, and has been a crew member on the annual Star Trek The Cruise for the last mm. five voyages. He was uh, featured as an on-air commentator in National Geographic's channel's Generation X series, uh, contributed to the HuffingtonPost.com, StarTrek.com, performed at the Nerd Night Nerdtacular, and has been featured on several pop culture blogs and serious XM radio shows. Rob is a member of the International Association of Media Tie-In Writers, serves on the advisory board of the MS in Publishing program at Pace University, and has served on the board of directors of Teachers and Writers collaborative you can read more about this on his website rob perlman www.robperlman.com so Ooh. that kind of list of credentials i know that we're just dealing with and i don't want to say this kind of glibly but you know a a young young adults novel but i think it takes someone with that kind of an education to be able to distill something as sophisticated as like a star trek episode into something that's suitable to be to be digested by this age range wouldn't you say i i don't disagree with you at all on that yeah i and i think that the fact that he's written star trek books before they probably you know i'm just guessing here said hey rob you want to write the first star trek prodigy novel he probably said heck yes i would yeah <laughs> and he can tap into these characters write a big grand story all in a hundred something pages and make it readable for anybody yeah I, I must have been daunting but at the same time must have been really enjoyable to to get into these characters heads um yeah. you know and, and where this book takes place it's not like he had the full story maybe he did i don't know but you have to be able to write in a transitional part of of the space in between episode 10 and episode 11 that was right for us that was eight months apart <laughs> you know yes. in broadcast in broadcast time so um i say we just jump right into the story uh we've had you know you and i have gone back and trying to formulate a list of questions that would answer and yet not spoil the book so yes let's let's jump right into it so um <laughs> we know that this story takes place at the end of a moral star part two that would be episode 10 of the series right so yeah. it's taking place in that space between the front half and the back half and you really do mentally have to put yourself there yeah i will say that mm -hmm. and i know that uh canonically we, we we take books like this as an extension of details that would happen in universe so that's how we're going to have to probably approach like this book now uh in terms of like our overall conversation we may even right. reference this later on <laughs> uh sometime during season two maybe supernova is referenced sometime later on in season two who knows maybe right? it might but this is where you know we would get that information uh, as far as i know uh because i don't know any further than this book it's a self-contained story so it's a pocket universe within the timeline between uh, episode 10 and episode 11. Um, but why is the story important, do you think, Shar, for aside from content being important? Well, it does give us a little bit more into the inner workings of our characters' mm -hmm. minds, just because when you're reading, you know, a page, you can just analyze a little more about what the the inner dialogue is like just by the writing nature um but also i don't know this is just like a okay i want to say that this is like a bonus prodigy quote unquote episode okay you know that takes place in between these two halves where if you don't read it you're probably not going to miss out on anything necessarily that you have to know going forward certainly not within the back half but if you're reading it you're, it's just a, an extra story. It's another story that you didn't know was there until you did. And what I would have loved to have done, though, Norm, is mm -hmm. read this book 
in between the front half of the season and the back half. Now, I understand that the video game was out and I didn't get in on that right away. (laughs) I'm hoping to do that this summer when things maybe will slow down just a little bit. But there's things in this book where if you would have read it during the break would have actually been like, whoa, revelations. But now that we've seen the whole season, it's not as revelatory. Does that make sense? As long as, yeah, as long as the story didn't feel like, and it didn't for me, didn't feel like it was setting up or telegraphing future events. No, 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 no. It reveal, it makes revelations in its own way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I did, however, find a couple things very interesting. Now I thought- you find interesting? Well, there are a lot of great things. One little nitpicky thing, and I'm surprised that it actually- maybe got, I don't know, like I, I said, I don't know what, what Rob Perlman's sources were at the time, you know, w- did he see past a certain episode or did he have just notes? I don't know because mm-hmm. on pages five through six, they were describing Jane Way's uniform. And it said that she was still wearing the black and red uniform from the first eight episodes because oh yeah and that's yeah. oh ooh, really good catch so i double checked and i made sure that the transformation of her voyager-esque uniform wearing the protostar delta that was transformed specifically in a moral star part one and it was eight minutes almost to the dot when <laughs> Dal and the crew changed uniforms, walked onto the bridge, and then Janeway said, I feel slightly underdressed or something to that effect. And then and she changed. hologram changed herself into the new yeah. uniform. So oh, I have a theory. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you know how in Star Trek, there's tons of different uniforms out there. And we have seen crews kind of transition from one uniform style to the other before I'm thinking Star Trek Generations for starters. This is just another one of those incidents where she's not totally ready to let go of the red uniform all the time. Not yet. This is some transition period for her, much as it was like a break for us. I can live with that. I mean, again, it's it's nothing that is like story shattering or it's not going to change the outcome of where we go in between this story and then into uh, a moral star part two and then into the next episode. So again, it's just <laughs> one of those things where I'm like, no, she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we yeah. Saw, which does make me wonder, did Rob Perlman just have notes or did he know the full story in, in every detail? Like where in production was he writing the book? Exactly. So again, nitpick doesn't change anything, yeah. doesn't change characterizations. It's, it's just one of those one. things that just kind of like make you go, oh, well, I wonder what happened there. <laughs> Things that make you go, hmm. Uh, but the more important thing, so I think Rob really captured the characterizations, like certain things, yes. like say, like Dow still feels uncertain. Like he still feels that high anxiety of, am I doing the right thing? Like when yeah. it's still plagued by guilt, you know, especially when she's thinking about the Cation orphan and what they just did saving all of them on Tars Lamora. Right. right. Which um, is why I was saying you've mentally got to put yourself into the mid-season break just because the mentality it really does strike you after you've seen the whole season that they're in a very different place back here yeah you know dallas even though he has some uncertainty going on he's still like outwardly overconfident and Mm -hmm. cocky and reckless and gwen is calling him out on that constantly but she was back then so rob does a fantastic job of putting these characters where they were and you can hear their voices mm-hmm. inside your head as you're reading. And I always think that's the mark of a good book. And, and it's also, I think, the mark of like the good series because the the voice characterizations and kind of like the, the personality traits and the nuances that everyone has brought to their characters, that's now, that's kind of like the soundtrack in my mind, right? When I'm reading this book. Yeah. Now, I have had disagreements and arguments uh with carol time and again and my wife carol where she's like why don't you just read something so that your imagination can like shape you know what you're reading and i said Mm -hmm. well most of the time i read things that are in the genre of 
things that I like, Star Wars, Star Trek, science fiction, things of that nature. So I can't really get outside of my head when I say like read a book that has to deal with Captain Picard, Captain Kirk, you know, right. Klingons, Romulans, Vulcans, et cetera, Spock, you know. Yeah, That's you know those even... faces. You can hear them inside your head. You can visualize them on the bridge or wherever they are. Right. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing not to have that. It just gives you so much more texture when you do have that, you know, right. especially in these, oh, in yeah. these original novels. Yeah, like I can imagine the crew on the bridge all talking together. There's the beautiful nebulae outside and those bright, vivid colors that we're so familiar with in Prodigy. And then also on the flip side of this are the visuals that you do have to make in your head because we have not seen them. At least I haven't. <laughs> not Again, not seeing the video game. It's probably in there. But having to envision what it is they're going through. Uh, like there's a part where they're going through a tunnel mm -hmm. and it's very well described. And I have a vision of what that looks like. Now, when I do play the game, I'm very curious to know, was I close or not? Because that's the fun of reading the book first is you have your idea, but then you get to see what everybody else's idea was, whether, right. you know, in, in terms of making the visual for it. Sure, sure. So, I, I actually think Rob excelled at doing both of those things, which is fantastic. Yeah. I wonder if he had an advanced copy of the game so he could play the game and write the, I guess it would be not necessarily kind of like a, a play by play, but having the broad strokes of, okay, you don't have to do all of these repeat quests because you either beat this boss or you failed this level. It's just the storyline. If you didn't have to continue to, you know, uh, in, in gaming terminology, like grind a bunch of mobs you know, like, or just beat a bunch of like, you know, NPC characters to get to the next level, right? Uh -huh. Which in this case would have been uh, the droids, you know, would have been uh, the, with their little like mechanical hands and tentacles and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, that's again, that's, um, it, it's, it's hard to say, cause again, I haven't played it yet and I, and I hope I will, but uh, going, oh, here's another weird thing. I know this is a weird tangent, but it just, it just popped <laughs> up in my notes. I like weird tangents. Go for it. Okay, so did you notice in the book that there were only on specific pages a black delta separating paragraphs? Oh, like as a transition? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of a weird arrhythmic pattern, yeah? Yeah, so I don't know. See, I always think that there is like some kind of... Uh, some kind of collaboration with like game designers and you know other people that work in the licenses to maybe like hide codes like you know in like you know work that way like work some kind of secret in there so <laughs> if you're listening to this i did the homework for you so these deltas only show up on these pages out of a hundred and well, i wouldn't say 160 minus say 152 pages worth of story yeah it's actually the story itself is 147 pages no stop 47 oh my gosh. okay perfect. please tell me that was on purpose that's amazing i love that <laughs> But here are the okay. pages. Here are the pages that that little black delta is on or are on. Pages 42, 44, 57, 71, 74, 76, 84, 92, 145, and 146. Now, this is on the hardcover okay. version. I'm sure the pagination is the same on the softcover version or the paperback version. But if you're using that so sparingly, and and not it didn't feel like they were like breaking up. This is what happened in one scene over here, Black Delta. This is what's happening in one scene over there. Sometimes they're literally like in the same conversation. So I'm like, that's a weird place to put some type of this hmm. like a uh, a wingding, as we used to call them in Mac, right? The wingdings, <laughs> right? Yes. So okay, what is your theory here, Dorm? What's going on? I have no idea. It's just because it's so <laughs> random. So I don't know. Okay. If I don't know if this is some kind of like code in the game or uh, coordinates because of, I was thinking about the doll's foot. Sorry, that's a spoiler. That's I shouldn't really say that, but ah. it's not, you know, I know. Um, but I'm thinking like these numbers are like some kind of code of some kind. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I don't okay. Know. Well, that's terribly interesting. I did yeah. not catch on to that. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> My artist's brain, every time I see something like out of place, remember those 
highlight magazines from like the 1980s, 1990s. Oh, you'd go yes. into a doctor's office and you would find them. And <laughs> the, like, there Sarah, are those yes. pictures, like what's wrong with this picture? And your brain uh-huh. like focuses on, you know, there's like a toaster, but it's upside down. Oh, you know, yeah. or there's like a TV with like an ice cream cone through it or something like that. Something weird. You know, that's <laughs> that's what I saw when I was reading this. That has nothing to do with the story and has nothing to do with the quality of the story at all. Um, <laughs> we have a little bit of time left here, but I know, Shar, you have some great notes on just some of the some of the finer details that don't get into spoilery territory. Sure. Well, how about we we talked a little bit about Gwen and Dal and their characterizations and where they were mentally. How about the other characters? Let's talk about like Jankum and Rock and Murph. Mm-hmm. And how do you think they translated to the page? Was it good? Uh, yeah. Well, when you start off with Jank and Pog saying Jank and Pog does this, Jank and Pog does that. <laughs> yes. Right. Because then all of a yeah. sudden, you know, you know, you're hearing um, Jason's Jank and Pog voice. Like it just it just pops in your head or what I did like. I really did like that Rob paid attention to Zero's pronouns. Yes. That's very responsible as a writer. And again, the language, the syntax, how Zero says things, Mm -hmm. very accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. I felt like those two were nailed down. They were solid. Also, Hologram Janeway was per usual advisor self. Do you think that it's hard to separate what we know from reading this, like going in blind, like say someone wants to try uh this or buy this as a gift for their young fan that, that's in their family you know it's either a son daughter niece nephew whatever and they said i'm a star trek fan this is for someone their age i want to buy this for them maybe they might get into star trek is this story strong enough on its own and the characterization solid enough on its own for them to be able to be yeah i really want to watch this series now hmm. oh that's a good question and you know, to be honest, I'm not terribly sure just because there is so much that happens in the first half of the series. I wonder how much context you need. And it's not that the book does a bad job of giving you a little bit of a refresher to remind you where they are and what has happened at this point in the uh, of the story. But for somebody who doesn't know anything at all about Prodigy, I don't know. I mean, I would really encourage somebody to watch the first half, then read the book. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough, you know, when you're going in uh, without without a primer of any kind. And the funny thing is, and it's maybe a little bit ironic, that the the Hagemans created Prodigy as kind of a primer for young adults or a younger audience from the very beginning to understand. And I do believe they used these terms like, what is a starship? What is warp drive? What right, is the Federation? Right. You know, what are these elements in Star Trek that... You know, veteran fans like ourselves and and many of you out there, we take for granted because it's just it's, you know, it's just it's part of our vocabulary. You know, it's secondhand. <laughs> but to a new right, it's embedded member, in our brains. They don't know. They don't know like why are they going yeah. so fast, or what does that mean, or pushing that button, or what does warp mean? You know, what are these aliens? So, I can't I can't fault Rob for not maybe establishing that very solidly at the beginning of the book because he does reference a lot of what we've already seen like say he from does. um the very first two episodes but he does drop you into the story so you're not going to get all that exposition yeah like you're talking about you do get the finer details like especially with mentality like right off the bat doll is you know, this doll at this particular point of the story, it reminded me just so much of how he grew too. By the end of season one, he is a very different, much more mature and responsible and thoughtful guy than he is here. (laughs) But this is how he was at this time in the story. Uh, Gwen, on the other hand, is dealing with lots of guilt and what have you. A lot of things fresh in her mind, like her father's betrayal and what Mm -hmm. does that mean? And a lot of confusion. Uh, but then, on the other hand, Gwen and Dell are working together a lot in this story. So you see them still paving their friendship along the way. Yeah. And that's obviously more of that is always better than less, you know, because yeah. you just know that they're just not idle the entire time between, you know, episodes 10 and 11. You know, they're building they're building that relationship. There's more layers, you know, that can be added, you know, in the context of their friendship where... Maybe if you're watching the episodes after this story, you know, a certain glance or a certain pinky hug or, you know, (laughs) 
<laughs> mean more. Maybe. Because of stories like this, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then for Rock Talk, mm-hmm. I had a question for you about Rock Talk because yeah. I have mixed feelings about her characterization. Okay. <laughs> I thought she sounded maybe just a little too little girlish, but she is a little girl. So what am I really saying here? Is it because we don't get the stark contrast of Rock's size versus her voice in a printed page? Maybe, because really the only time she's using her size to her advantage is when she wants to help her friends. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's great. I love that situation where she doesn't have to, like, she's not throwing her weight around just because she's doing like it because she wants to. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But she is an eight-year-old girl. Why am I criticizing her for sounding like an eight-year-old girl? But it's almost like it wasn't quite rock talk. And especially after she had spent so much time in Time Amok mm-hmm. that she grew up so much in, in that that period, learned so much. And, you know... She's she's making jokes that I just don't think fit her. That's fair. I had similar feelings. Uh, okay. And I, th- I think it's just because, again, there's with with Jankum, he has a, a very like literal key when he talks. You know, it always starts mm-hmm. off with him in the third person, and we figured out why. Um, yes. And you're right. Zero has a very specific cadence when they talk, but also the pronouns they identify zero as zero. So you yes. immediately key into that. Uh, I think with Rock, it's because of her physicality versus her age and and the way that she talks and, and the inflections in her voice and in her pitch. Those are at two extreme odds visually, right? So it's it just doesn't really come off the page the same way. Is maybe, that fair? Yeah, yeah, maybe it just doesn't completely translate yeah i don't know but I, 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 it's not a huge criticism it's just something that i kind of i kind of did a second take if for any of the characters that i felt wasn't like right off of the screen into the page it was her too yeah i agree yeah, it, yeah there, everybody for me, else it was, was just a little off everybody else was on point yeah, yeah. including murph and i love the way that Murph's well, dialogue well, 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 well. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know it's so good it's so good so yeah. good and and Murph gets to do a cool Murph thing that only Murph can do it's it's fun this is a fun adventure and it is a big high stakes story and yet it is contained in just a few pages so if ever we get Rob Perlman on the show we're going to ask him okay so you reach out to D. Bradley Baker and this is what he <laughs> says this is how Murph sounds like if he had right. typed out, you know, in sentence form. I right. want to know all the details. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple last points here, Shar, and then um, there are a couple other details uh, for the upcoming books that I'd like to talk about. Sure. So I guess my final thought is if you, uh, I don't actually care if you're of target age or not, go get the book. Read the book. Yeah, get the book. You know, I'm a grown adult and I enjoyed it. If you enjoy books, put this in your collection. It's a nice bonus prodigy story so while we're in this break it's a nice thing to just kind of keep yourself immersed in the world because i mean you know we're not we're used to breaks unfortunately right now no that's true that's true and we're probably not going to get the next season until later this year so use this to string yourself along and, and stay involved though with prodigy uh that leads into your point about future books what do you got for us so looking at it from amazon because i was looking at what they have uh, as as a collection of books so there are there are going to be a total of three books for at least up until the end of august and that may be for the end of the year so it's kind of like a trilogy of books so we already talked about a dangerous trade by cassandra rose clark this Mm -hmm. was released the same time that this book, Supernova, was released on January 27th of this year, 2023. Those two books, or these two books, I should say, are currently in both hardcover and paperback versions. And you can find both of these books on Amazon.com. And then Simon & Schuster tells you where their partners are selling the books, such as Barnes & Noble, et cetera. There were two other hidden image items that were also listed on Amazon and on Simon & Schuster. The third book is called Escape Route. So this was also written by Cassandra Rose Clark. 
and it is scheduled for release on August 1st, 2023, this year. And it's only listed right now as paperback. Now, here's ah. the interesting thing. So there's going to be a paperback version of this book, Escape Route. There's also one of Supernova and A Dangerous Trade. And these three paperbacks are going to be uh, they're going to be uh, packaged in a, their own separate boxed set. Oh, so like a trilogy? Book, like a trilogy of books. So you're going to have Supernova, oh, A Dangerous Trade, and Escape Route. And this will be available on August 29th this year, 2023. Again, okay. only in paperback for now. Question, does that mean these three books are all connected somehow? Uh, one could deduce that, sure. Um, it makes sense. But, you know, uh, publishers and you know, retailers, they love putting together collections. It'll be interesting <laughs> to see what the artwork looks like on the outside slipcover of these yes. books. And uh, looking at it from kind of like a dollars and cents standpoint, maybe the initial sales of the hardcover books probably weren't maybe that high. So you can go to the easier, more affordable paperback route, you know, especially for a sure. collection. Um, I'm surprised yeah. that they won't All release on. it in maybe a trade paperback or kind of like a a compilation where all three books are like in one, you know, large bound format. Uh, but some people like having their separate books. So it'll be interesting. You know, <laughs> again, if you're a collector out there and you love these products and you want to speak with your voice and you speak with your dollars, you know, in the regional <laughs> world, that's your voice. That's right. You have to support those people that are putting out these products with buying them. Pretty much. Right. Yep. We have a voice in two ways, our time and our dollars. Use them wisely. Yep. <laughs> well, I think that pretty much wraps it up for us on this one. Now, we are going to read the second book and do a similar thing like we did today with that one in the future going forward. But in the meantime, we do want to hear from our audience. It's our favorite part of the show. We, we absolutely want to hear your voices and your thoughts. So we have some questions for you. Mm -hmm. If you read Supernova, please send us a message and tell us the following your name and your age. Did you read the book by yourself or with someone else? And if so, whom? Uh, did you like the book? What was your favorite part? What did you learn? Familiar questions? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you also played the Supernova game, would you also tell us which one you liked better and why? We can't wait to hear from you. Those are great questions. And I love that you brought in our, our, our core group of questions because, <laughs> yeah, there is something that you can learn from this story. Yes, you right? sure can. Absolutely. Yeah. There's the morals, messages, and meanings in the book, just like in an episode. All right. Well, those are great questions, Sarah. Thanks for bringing that up. And uh, what do you say we close the show? Let's do it. Well, Mission Log Prodigy is produced by Roddenberry Entertainment. Production and technical direction is by the fantastic Earl Green. Our website and your opportunity to comment and connect with us is at missionlogpodcast.com. And if you want to support Mission Log directly, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log. So thank you everyone for taking the time to be with us. And even though we are still in between seasons, rest assured that Shar and I are working on plans to bring you even more fantastic content, especially from these new products that are going to be coming out throughout the course of this year. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Hopefully. Between now and then. So Prodigy <laughs> Season 2 will be here before we know it. You know, time goes by very quickly. So make sure you subscribe to us here on the Roddenberry YouTube Entertainment Channel on YouTube for the video version. Remember to subscribe to us on the podcast version so you can be notified for all of our upcoming Prodigy coverage. Thank you for listening and go boldly and go fast. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.